Tanks. I'm one of the Product Tank um, MK uh, organizers. This is our first ever remote session, so we are getting used to the technology. Uh, and a big thank you for being here. We've got people from all around the UK and all parts of the world, I believe. So um, really appreciate you taking some time out and coming to our meetup. So as Claudia mentioned, we are going to be recording the session, or at least attempting to, and we're going to make that recording and the slides from the talk available after the session. Um, if we could ask you to please stay on mute during the talk. Uh, questions will be taken at the end uh, via the chat window, um, but please wait until the end of the session so that we don't get those distractions of the chat window uh, flashing away so that we can all uh, focus on the talk that would be great. So a little bit about Product Tank Milton Keynes. So Product Tank MK is run and sponsored by people from a number of partnering organisations. Uh, with bases in Milton Keynes. Uh, so this is Red Tangerine, Workforce Software and Office Depot. Um, tonight's event is organized and sponsored by my company, Red Tangerine. We provide accredited training classes and services in the Lean Agile space. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Claudia, uh, my co-organizer and partner at Red Tangerine, um, who made this event possible. So she did a lot of the organizing for tonight and uh, behind the scenes she's going to be ensuring that all the technology is uh, running as smoothly as possible as we can make it. Um, so it's great to see so many people sign up from so many different parts of the world. Um, just as a quick shout out and question, um, can I ask you to put your location in the chat window? So maybe your city or your country, just give us a feel for where, every, where everybody is from. Let's see, Milton Keynes, uh, Brighton, Denver, Colorado. We have someone from Costa Rica as well. That's yeah. nice. <laughs> it's just uh, Ireland, Overland Park, UK, uh, US, Leicester, Christchurch, New Zealand. Wow, I think Fabio wins the prize for being from the furthest away. Amsterdam, Hersey, Pennsylvania, Reading, Glasgow, Netherlands. Oh, and uh, the dark side of the moon. So I think that's an attempt to win the furthest away prize. There is no prize for that, unfortunately. Cool, nice. Thank you for that. Um, so, uh, some of you might not be aware of uh, where or what Milton Keynes is. Uh, so, we are um, located around 15 miles north of London. We're famous for a couple of things. The first one is these things. Uh, this is a roundabout. Milton Keynes has got hundreds of them. So, if you've ever been here, you would have uh, had the pleasure of driving around lots of uh, these roundabouts. The other thing that we're famous for, these things. These are the Milton Keynes concrete cows. They are cow sculptures made out of concrete. That's all I can really say on that, really. So that's what we're famous for. So on to tonight's guest. We are delighted to welcome Roman Pitchler. Roman is a leading agile product management expert with more than 15 years experience in teaching product professionals and helping companies to become successful product management organizations. Uh, we at Red Tangerine, we frequently refer to many of Roman's tools and tips in our work at organizations and in our training classes. So we're always using a lot of his techniques. Roman has recently published a new book called How to Lead in Product Management. And here he shares tips for dealing with difficult stakeholders, constructively resolving conflicts and creating value together. And this is going to be the basis for Roman's talk today. We are going to be giving away a copy of Roman's book um, as part of the meetup. So to be in with a chance of winning, simply post a comment on tonight's session on LinkedIn or Twitter with the hashtags product tank MK, product leadership or product management or product management with all the vowels taken out. I will post those into the uh, chat window so you can uh, copy paste those put, to put them into your um, into your posts. So yeah, we will be looking for those on social media. Cool, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Roman and he's going to talk us through uh, how to lead in product management. Over to you, Roman. Well, thank you very much, David, for the kind introduction. So hopefully you can all see a slide that says dealing with difficult stakeholders. Uh, that's uh, the topic uh, that I've chosen and uh, I hope uh, that uh, the tips, the suggestions, the recommendations I have to share uh, will be helpful for you. Now, whenever I meet somebody who um, I uh, find difficult, 
um, maybe because I disagree with uh, the opinions of the individuals or the, the behavior the person displays, or, you know, I just find the person a, not a very likable uh, individual, then there's a level of friction or disagreement or dispute present. And, um, you know, conflict and, and friction is, is nothing bad per se. It's completely natural. It simply happens when two or more people are in disagreement and experience a clash of interests. So, you know, it rut routinely occurs at home. It routinely occurs at work. Uh, no, no big deal. Um, now you might say if conflict is so common, then, you know, why talk about conflict and dealing with difficult people here in the context of product management? Well, I do think that as a product uh, people, as product managers, product owners, product professionals, we experience a fair amount of conflict. And, um, one of the reasons for that is, uh, the nature of our role. Ah. So uh, as product people, we have a highly networked role. We interact with uh, various groups and those groups can have diverging uh, interests and perspectives. So they're the users and customers and depending on your product, you know, that might be a fairly large market. It might be also quite a heterogeneous market, but even if it isn't, often users and customers have different ideas and have different needs. So, you know, that can be an element of uh, disagreement. And then we interact with the business stakeholders. So those are individuals from the various departments and business units, for example, a marketeer, uh, a sales person, maybe somebody from service or support, or maybe somebody from finance, uh, depending on the product that we look after. And as these people come from different parts of the business, again, they tend to have different perspectives and different interests. And so there, there can be disagreement, there can be friction. And we uh, guide development teams, one or more development teams, assuming they are agile teams, uh, and they're likely to be cross-functional and people are likely to have different backgrounds and different skills and again, different viewpoints. So we're right at the middle here. And so it's no wonder that uh, we experience a fair amount of, well, disagreement and conflict. Um, now, unfortunately, most of the conflicts that I've witnessed at work were not handled particularly skillfully. So some were suppressed and ignored and most were never resolved properly. And if, when that happens, then conflicts leave behind a trail of bad feelings and mistrust and damage connections. But on the positive side, if we learn to constructively address conflict, then it can become a source of creativity and innovation for our products. And it can strengthen uh, the connections we have to others, improve collaboration and help us learn more about ourselves. So to make this a little bit more uh, concrete, I've uh, selected a scenario uh, from my uh, latest book. And so the person being spoken to um, um, is a person in charge of the product, a product manager or product owner. And we have a, a rather pushy senior stakeholder appearing on the scene. Um, Listen, I really need you to add this feature to the release and I'm not going to take no for an answer, says Sophie, the head of sales, as she stands in front of your desk. You can feel your shoulders tensing and your stomach tightening. There is no way that you can add more work to the development effort. The dev team is already struggling with the current workload, but Sophie is a powerful senior manager who will not be afraid to escalate the issue. What should you do? Now you may have different reactions to this story, but it turns out that as humans, we tend to pursue quite commonly four strategies to address conflict. But unfortunately, these four strategies aren't particularly helpful. I've taken them uh, from a book called Say What You Mean um, by Orin J. Seufer. And uh, the first strategy is called uh, competitive confrontation. So in this scenario, applying competitive confrontation to the scenario I just shared with you, that would mean that I stand up to Sophie and I engage in an open conflict. So I might say to Sophie, I hear what you say. I hear that this feature is important to you, but there's no way that we can add this to the development effort. As you know, 
the team's already fully loaded and we're struggling to reach the desired outcome within the time frame that we have and on budget. There's no way I can add this and I'm not going to take this. Um, and anyway, you know, how come you come here and you demand this feature and you interrupt my work and you shout at me? So I, I would very much um, try and put Sophie in her place. I would uh, believe that I'm right and Sophie is wrong. Uh, I might believe that if I don't stand up and fight for my interests, I'll lose out. And any empathy I might show would be seen as a sign of weakness and used against me. So I'll try and push back on Sophie and ultimately I'll try and, and win. Now, if this is a smart strategy to use in the scenario uh, I shared with you, given that Sophie is a senior and significantly more powerful uh, individual, you know, I leave that up to you. But I've, I've certainly seen product people use this strategy. The second option we have is to still try and uh, get the better of Sophie, but this time in a more indirect way and you know, use passive aggression. So a little bit like guerrilla warfare, guerrilla tactics. Um, so the assumption here would be that we're being treated unfairly um, and that openly addressing the conflict wouldn't make a difference and could make things worse. So, you know, we're trying now maybe to be difficult or possibly even rude. And uh, we could say to Sophie, um, what, you're, what you're asking for is going to be extremely difficult. And I don't really like, like what I'm hearing, particularly, on, Sophie, to be honest with you. Of course, I'll, I'll, I'll try and do my best to make it somehow happen, but I can't give you a definitive answer right now. I'll have to go and talk to the development team and see what I can do. I'll put it on the backlog for now, but yeah, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on this one. And then maybe go to the development team and say, huh, guess what, guys? Sophie just came and she demanded that I put this feature on the backlog. Hey, but don't worry. You know, no reason to be overly concerned. I'll deprioritize it straight away. So we're not going to get to it. And maybe then talk badly about Sophie behind her back to other product people. So again, this is still a strategy very much focused on winning it's still a strategy that's very much focused on believing i'm right i'm wrong sophie's the one uh, to blame and i have to yeah i have to sort of somehow uh, put her in her place and get try and get the better of her the next strategy is uh called co conflict avoidance and here we uh, try not so much to win but more to um minimize our losses so uh, conflict avoidance in the, in the uh, Sophie scenario would, could mean that um, I, I sort of take the, the approach of saying, is this feature request such a big deal? I mean, Sophie is a senior stakeholder. You know, she's been around for a long time. She's very well connected in the company. She's a very knowledgeable person, usually a reasonable person. I'm sure there's a very good uh, reason why she's requesting that feature. We can go and ask her, in fact. Maybe we should just be really, uh, you know, act in a rational way, be, be grown ups and, um, you know, ha have a can do attitude. Uh, it's going to be impossible to fully implement this feature in the current uh, development effort in the next two, three months or something. But, you know, maybe, maybe we can split the difference. Maybe we can strike a compromise and do part of it, maybe half of it or so. And that'll sort of help Sophie a little bit. And, you know, it might just be possible. Now, some of you might say, like, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Hey, let's do this. Um, and, you know, superficially, it seems to solve the, the problem. But when we take a closer look, then it doesn't really address the underlying conflict. Um, so what I think Sophie's doing here in this scenario is that she's paying disrespect to the role of the product person. She really treats the individual like project manager, team lead, but maybe even more so like a personal assistant demanding that a feature is being implemented. And I don't think that's a way to treat a empowered product person, an empowered product professional. And then I would expect that you have a product strategy review process established in your company where, you know, on a, re on a regular basis, key stakeholders and development team representatives come together and look at the product strategy, look at the product roadmap, look at the product performance, the trends, what the competition is doing, any requests and ideas for new features or changes to desired outcomes and benefits that you want to create with your product and then together decide on the right way forward. So Sophie coming here and trying to expedite and push through her feature and, and her interests 
I don't think it's really right and pays disrespect to the established processes. So if we now try and strike a deal, we don't address those underlying issues. And worse so, we let Sophie get away with what I would consider inappropriate behavior. And, you know, potentially that sets a precedence. And, you know, who says that Sophie's not going to act in a similar way um, in the future and that other stakeholders are not going to not going to copy her. So I don't think that would be helpful. And finally, uh, passivity, uh, that would really mean mean saying, uh, you know, you know, I'd, uh, what should I do? <laughs> you know. I'm just a little product person and, and there's Sophie, uh, you know, she's so much more powerful and, and, and well connected in the organization. She's a, she's a really influential individual. I mean, I can, I can try and stand up to her and say no, but it's no point because if I do it, she'll escalate it. And five minutes later, my boss will be at my desk telling me to make it happen and implement that feature. So I might as well say yes now. And then, yeah, it's going to be difficult. I, I, I don't know what I should, I mean, I'll have to go and talk to the development team and see if I can persuade them maybe to work a few extra hours during the week or maybe come in at the weekend or something. That's going to be tough, but, but what should I do? I don't have a choice. Now, first of all, I don't think that's right. And secondly, by taking this approach, we essentially, as the person in charge of the product, uh, give up our needs and not only our needs, but also the needs of the development team. So I don't think that would be, would be right. Now, if those four strategies aren't helpful, then what, what could help us? Well, it, it turns out that uh, a while back, um, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the United States, uh, encountered a similar but admittedly much more extreme um, challenge. So imagine you're faced with the following situation. Armed terrorists have kidnapped a group of civilians and they are now asking for a ransom and threatening to kill the hostages if their demands aren't met. Now, if you grew up in the 1980s with Hollywood movies like I did, you might be tempted to suggest to send in a Rambo-like agent who can single-handedly free the hostages and capture the baddies. It turns out the FBI have tried this strategy, but with a low success, but high death rate. So they've developed something else over the years, and this something else is called the behavioral change stairway model, uh, admittedly quite a mouthful. Um, I'd like to uh, present this model now to you, and it's uh, based, my description is based on a Chris Foss book, uh, Never Split the Difference. No matter if we're faced with an armed terrorist or a difficult senior stakeholder, what we'd like to encourage is a positive behavior change. So in the case of Sophie, we'd like her, uh, I would suggest, to be more collaborative. Um, we'd like her to pay respect to the role product people play uh, and also um, respect the product management processes that have been established in the organization. Now, how can we do this? As product people, we don't hold any trans transactional power. We can't tell other people, certainly not senior stakeholders, what to do. And to make things worse, we're usually not in a position to offer an incentive like a bonus or pay rise or something like that. So the only way then to encourage the behavior change is to influence the individual, influence Sophie, so that she uh, opens up to our perspective, opens up to our ideas and suggestions and is willing to follow our lead. Now, how do we do this? How do we get Sophie to open up to us and follow our lead. Well, the key element here is to build rapport, to build a trustful connection with Sophie, or if we already have a meaningful connection established with her, then to deepen it and earn her trust. Only if Sophie trusts us will she be willing to listen to us and follow our advice. And that then hopefully gives rise to the appropriate behavior. Now, how do we build trust? Well, a key technique in order to build trust is to, em to empathize, empathize with Sophie. So not to um, try and get the better of her and uh, in a way be at, at, um, at, at adverse, adversarial. I can't say the word right now, adversarial. Oh, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, um, and uh, maybe maybe um, 
act out our possibly possibly act out our frustration or uh, even even um, uh, anger and uh, tell her what to do but try and cultivate uh, acceptance and openness and, and warm-heartedness uh, come from a place of of curiosity and care and that doesn't mean that we agree with her behavior it doesn't mean that we agree with her views it just means that we we accept it and we, we take a sincere genuine interest in what's going on for sophie um, you know what's what's driving her behavior what's behind this what are the underlying needs and that's best done by actively listening to her, by making a real effort to take in what she has to say. So that's the behavioral change stairway model. Uh, it's called a stairway model because these um, steps are sequential. So you can't skip them and you shouldn't try to rush them. So, you know, through active listening, you build empathy and understanding that leads to trust that then gives you the ability to influence the person and makes it more likely that the person will listen to you and follow your advice and that hopefully then gives rise to a behavior change but of course there's no guarantee that uh, this will happen there's no guarantee that sophie will change her behavior for the better but given that we don't have any transactional power and can't kind of make sophie change her behavior force her you know what what alternatives are there what choice in a way do we have and if this works for terrorists i'm pretty sure it, it works for sophies as well now as active listening is so important in this model right it's the very first step it gets us started i thought i'll share three listening tips uh, with you and uh, and the first one is to be fully present and listen attentively uh, may sound uh, fairly trivial I just listen just listen attentively but i find it can be hard um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sometimes so caught up in, in work and rush from one task to the other, from one meeting to the next, and, you know, I find it really hard to kind of focus and truly listen to someone. Um, but that's really important. It's not only important to take in all the information, but also to make the individual feel valued. So I think as human beings, we, uh, we, 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 we sense if somebody tru is, tr is truly listening to us, um, or if the person sort of is half listening and pretending to, to listen. And so when somebody really fully listens to you, that really does make you feel uh, appreciated. And it then makes it, makes it easier to, to share more information and in a way open up. So in order to um, um, listen attentively, you know, my suggestion is that you try not to uh, be in a rush, but uh, that you make time, particularly before an important conversation, an important meeting, to get ready and then the the other suggestion i have is um, not to have a difficult conversation and uh, engage in in some form of conflict resolution if you're still kind of um, all wound up by what happened so you know if i imagine sophie comes to me i'm working at my desk and you know she she speaks to me and you know says you, you really got to make this happen um, you know, I might might feel might feel irritated and confused, but I might also feel um, a little bit frustrated, or I might might even feel feel anger. There might be an element of anxiety. You know, what what the impact is on the development effort, but also you know what happens if I say no, and what what happens to me, and what it would look like on me, and what Sophie would say about me, and and so forth. And as as long as I'm still caught up in those kind of emotions and associated thoughts i think i wouldn't be in the right state of mind to to talk to sophie so then uh, it probably would be better to say um sophie this is really important for me i really want to resolve this with you but i'm a little bit worked up right now can we please have this conversation in an hour's time or in the afternoon or tomorrow morning or whenever the right point in time is the next tip uh, is encourages you to be respectfully curious, suspend judgment and cultivate an open mind. Now, um, I think it was uh, Stephen Covey who once said, uh, we often don't listen with the intention to understand, but to respond. And that means that not only are we not fully present and not only don't we listen uh, attentively, but also we start kind of judging and evaluating what somebody is saying very quickly and already starting to formulate, make, making an anal analysis while the person is speaking and starting to uh, formulate our, our response, our, our answer, while 
but we're still listening. Now, when that happens, there's a danger that we um, don't hear out the person, that we miss out important information and that we kind of cling on to preconceived ideas and viewpoints. And um, in some cases, that, can, that can, can be a real disadvantage. We might find out if we attentively listen to Sophie with an open mind that actually she's got a very good point. There's a very good reason why we should maybe even change the desired benefit of the development effort and the, the outcome we'd like to achieve over the next three months and, and definitely, definitely um, make that feature happen, provide that feature. But again, you know, if we're, if we're closed minded, if we're closely attached to our ideas and our perspectives, um, and don't really pay close attention and open up to the other person's perspective, we may well miss that. So when it comes to, to validation, I think we've got this great guideline in product management to separate data collection from data analysis. So first gather all the data and then look at it, evaluate it, analyze it, draw the right conclusions. I think we should try and do the same thing in conversations. So when we listen, we should really focus on listening, then pause and let it sink in and think about, okay, how am I going to respond? What I'm going to do with the, the pieces of, of information that I've, um, that I've received. And then, yeah, then speak. Um, easier said than done though. Um, but that way, you know, chances are that we, we offer the right answer and, uh, we don't overlook, uh, important pieces of information. And finally, listen uh, for facts, but not only for facts, um, listen also for emotions and underlying needs. So emotions often manifest themselves in the body language uh, a person's displaying. Um, so if Sophie comes to me and she's got a red face and she speaks rather loudly, chances are that she's upset. And that'd be an interesting piece of information. Uh, I can then uh, inquire why, why is that? And what are the underlying, what's connected to that, which maybe need hasn't been met or what, what kind of interest does Sophie have? And maybe ask an open question. I could say, for instance, to her, Sophie, you know, please help me understand why is this feature so important and why is it so important to you? Um, and uh, understanding the other person's interests and underlying needs is so important because often they are the gateway to finding a mutually uh, acceptable and a sustainable agreement. If we just stay at the surface, if we ch just stay at what, what people have said and you know what they want or what they don't want, and we don't go deeper and understand the why, then often coming up with a solution and resolving the conflict is impossible. Whoops, what have I done? moved my my mouse and things have disappeared so uh, those were my three listening tips um, there are a few more tips i have uh, but this time uh, around trust building so empathy is already something that i've mentioned that plays a, a an important uh, role in the behavioral change survey model but there are more things you can do in order to earn the trust of uh, stakeholders uh, the first one is to speak and act with integrity to so say what do you believe is true and then walk your own talk Again, sounds sounds pretty pretty straightforward, pretty trivial, really. But uh, when I reflect on my own uh, work and my own career, then uh, there's one specific uh, episode that springs to mind. I was uh, working on a brand new product development, uh, on a development effort for, for a brand new product, I should say. I was working on a brand new product in the telco space, and it wasn't going too well. And so I, uh, the boss I had, he he was uh, a senior person. He was quite a tall uh, person, quite a big person, so you know, quite a figure. And he could be very nice and uh, quite warm-hearted, but he could also get pretty grumpy and, um, yeah, fairly arsy with people. And so as I kept bringing him bad news, he appreciated that less and less. And so over time, I started to become more and more careful and sugarcoating messages and saying, oh, yeah, I know, I know, this isn't looking too good, but... You know, uh, you know, it's not that bad either. And I think with a little bit of luck and the right effort, I'm sure we can hit our, our, our delivery date. Um, but it, deep inside, I knew that you know, it was virtually impossible. So it's not that I was lying intentionally per se, or that I, I, I sort of you know, had any bad intentions. I was trying to protect myself because I kind of feared the reaction of my boss. But in hindsight, it would have been better to have the courage to speak the truth. Because, you know, by sugarcoating my messages, 
I uh, indirectly supported my boss's inappropriate behavior. And no employee, no product person should be told off for telling the truth and showing data. You know. But yeah, as I said, in hindsight. Um, so speak and act with integrity, that's the first one. Uh, the next one is get to know people and allow people to get to know you. So it's kind of hard to trust someone if we, if you know very little about the person, we're all influenced by our backgrounds and, you know, family context and, um, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, equally it's kind of difficult for people to follow your lead if they know very little about yourself. And so one of the things you can do in order to, um, get to know people is a technique that, uh, Patrick Lencioni uh, suggested in his book, uh, the five dysfunctions of a team. So you share failure stories. But the two things that you uh, should probably um, take into account. The first one is share a genuine failure story where you made a mistake. And secondly, um, if that's what you want to do, then maybe start the process and lead by example. Um, and, you know, make sure that everybody feels safe to, to share a failure story or share, share a mis mistake. Or uh, maybe I should say why, why that can be a, a good thing and can build trust because it shows vulnerability. And, you know, when people show vulnerability, when you're willing to show vulnerability, then, you know, that tends to, tends to earn you the trust of others. And involve people in product decisions and encourage them to share their ideas and concerns. Well, that's a great way to appreciate people's perspectives and ideas and uh, understand their underlying needs. It shows that you, uh, you, value, you value them and you value their ideas. But of course, it shouldn't mean that um, you try and follow up on all suggestions and that you say yes to, to all ideas. That's not what collaborative decision making or generally decision making is all about. You, otherwise, you just end up with a weak compromise, um, which is usually not desirable. Um, but yeah, it's really uh, involving people in key product decisions, uh, hearing what they have to say, and then uh, trying to find a solution, a decision that moves your product forward, is right for your product, and uh, ensures that you get a solid buy-in from the stakeholders. And then uh, be, in su be supportive and try and offer help whenever uh, you, you can, but uh, at the same time, don't neglect your core responsibilities and don't sacrifice sustainable pace. A sustainable pace is the idea that we should work in such a way that our well-being isn't affected. Now, that sort of um, what what I quite often observe product people to do is that they that you know we, we because we, we are responsible for our products and we'd like to make sure that our products get progressed. We we kind of fill in the gaps. Um, you know, for instance, I often experience that product people don't have a Scrum Master Agile coach or that the Scrum Master Agile coach isn't uh, sufficiently available or adequately qualified. And then it's easy to say, oh, you know, I'll, I'll help the team with the development process or maybe there's some issues within the team, some collaboration issues. I'll, I'll help the guys. I'll, I'll, I'll try and help people sort it, sort it out. And while it's, it's great to care and it's great wanting to help, um, and it's perfectly okay, by the way, to do this uh, as a short-term solution, but if that becomes a permanent, a per more permanent solution, I think it's wrong because it would either lead to neglecting your core responsibility. And those are often then things around product discovery and strategy, which will have not an immediate, but a mid to long-term negative impact on your product. Or, well, you sacrifice sustainable pace and, um, you know, sacrifice your, your well-being. Neither is desirable. And similarly, some product people help out in marketing or, or and cover the marketeer or the sales rep and you know help with the sales collateral or the marketing strategy and you know similar thing great to care great wanting to help but you know if there's a if there's an if there's a systemic issue you know if 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 you know people aren't qualified or you don't have enough marketeers or scrum masters whatever it might be then it's better to um not cover and it's better to make that organizational impediment visible so that the organization can do something about it and, and, and grow and develop and improve. Uh, yes, at least in theory. And then uh, finally, strengthen your product management expertise. It's hard to uh, follow your lead if, uh, you know, again, generally it's hard to follow anybody, somebody who we believe may not really have sufficient knowledge. Um, so, you know, it's then hard to trust the individual. I remember having a conversation with uh, someone a, a while back and, um, the, the, the person, the lady said to me, um, that she'd like to take charge of, uh, the strategic decisions and own the product roadmap. And so we got talking and after a little while I said to her, but 
let me just quickly ask this question, please. You've created a product roadmap before, or you know, you'd be, comp you'd be kind of happy to, to create one. You know how to do this. And she looked at me slightly surprised and said, like, no. And I said to her, well, in that case, maybe you want to read up on some product roadmapping te techniques and just create a roadmap, present it to your management. And then, you know, they, they may see that, wow, you know, you can do this. You might as, we might as well ask you to, to continue doing it and thereby, you know, trust you. Um, but um, I don't think necessarily that's, that was the answer uh, the per person was expecting. I think it was more telling her that her management had to change, uh, not herself. Um, so to sum up, uh, dealing with difficult people is part and parcel of being a product professional. It's at least as important as other product management work like product road mapping and prioritizing the product backlog. So it would be a mistake in my mind to say, yeah, all this people stuff, all this, all these soft issues and leadership issues. I know, I know I've got to do it, but Hey, I've got to review the strategy and I've got to adjust the product roadmap. And then I've got to reprioritize the product backlog. I've got to, I've got so much real work to do that. That sort of needs to be done first. I think that'd be a mistake uh, because unresolved conflicts don't go away. They affect the relationships that we have with other, with other people. They can impact our mental well-being and they reduce productivity. Uh, working with individuals becomes then, particularly individuals we're in disagreement, we're in conflict with, becomes so much more difficult, but it typically also has an impact on uh, a wider group of people. Um, so I think it's, it's worthwhile really trying to balance the, the kind of hard work that we have to do that, of course, is important. You know, things like planning and reviewing plans, um, and the, the, the kind of the, the relationship building, the, the leadership work that we have to do. And, and ideally, the two things should fit together. Yeah. And finally, learning to resolve conflict and building trust, uh, I consider uh, as two leadership skills that uh, as product people, we should actively uh, develop. They strengthen connections, they uh, help improve the work environment, and they help us grow as individuals and leaders. So I hope uh, you found uh, my suggestions helpful. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, you can find out more about my thoughts on product leadership uh, on my website at robinpischler.com. And um, as David mentioned earlier, uh, I recently published a new book called How to Lead in Product Management that talks in more detail about dealing with difficult people, resolving conflict, collaborative decision-making and, th and those good things. I'm very much uh, looking forward to answering uh, some of your questions uh, now, but uh, if for whatever reason your question doesn't get answered, then don't be shy and uh, please uh, reach out to me and uh, drop me an email. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Roman. That was uh, captivating. That was excellent. Really enjoyed that. Uh, I see a lot of love from the, um, from, the, from the chat window as well. Lots of really positive uh, comments. We will see if we can open the, um, the mics at the end just uh, to show appreciation. Um, but yeah, we've got some time now to take uh, questions. So uh, some have been coming in during the talk. So yeah, if you want to uh, be uh, uh, putting your questions into the chat window, we'll try and get through as many as you can. Um, I'm going to be slightly selfish and ask my own question first, Roman, if you don't mind. Um, so uh, I'm actually really fascinated by the psychology of people. Um, so uh, I was really captivated by what you were talking about with the, um, the conflict strategies. Um, so when you were talking about the common unhelpful conflict strategies, uh, why is it that you think that it's so, that these are so common? So for, but when I, when I read those conflict strategies in Orange Joe Sofa's book, they really resonated with me because I think for me, it's like, wow, yeah, I, I've, I've engaged in competitive confrontation and yeah, I've been passive aggressive. Oh yeah, I've avoided conflict. And oh yeah, there's some, some instances, it doesn't that happen that often to me, but there are some instances where I've probably been passive and I've just kind of tried to suffer through it and just say like, yeah, whatever, whatever. Um, so they really resonated with me. And, you know, as I just said, I could think of a number of conflict scenarios that, that fitted into those four boxes. Um, and, um, and I think part of the reason why they are so common is that um, I don't think I was ever, ta ever, ever taught 
sorry, I mean, we're all influenced by how conflicts are be, being played out uh, in our families. And I think, you know, in, 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 our, in, in the family that we grew up in, um, but also at school and amongst friends. And then later, you know, at, at, at university and at the workplace. Um, but, but often the strategies that we experience, often the strategies that we are kind of informally taught that we soak up by observing how other people deal with uh, disagreement and conflict, often those strategies aren't very healthy. Um, and so these are yeah, unhealthy strategies that, that as human beings we, we tend to pursue, but yeah, unfortunately they, they don't result in, in truly resolving the conflict. They, they result in a winner and a loser. So I don't know if I've done a good job at answering your question, David. No, I think so. Yeah, I, I think yeah, it, it, it's it is it's related to just how as human beings we want to survive, isn't it? So it's like almost a defense mechanism. A lot of these um, behaviors, isn't it? To a certain extent, yeah. I think the the, the bottom ones are more about defending. The the top two are more about um, being aggressive and trying to win. The really interesting thing with conflicts, uh, with conflicts is as long as there's a winner and a loser, there is mistrust and there are bruised feelings, and one person will feel treated unfairly, and the conflict really isn't resolved. The conflict only is resolved if, in a way, both individuals feel that there's a solution they can live with. And um, I, I didn't mention it now, and I, I don't want to sort of, um, you know. Um, postpone answering more questions uh, much longer, but I, 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 I talk about a conflict resolution framework called nonviolent communication that some of you may be familiar with um, in my book. And the idea is not too dissimilar to the behavioral change stairway model where really we, we need to understand the other person's needs and we got to be clear on our needs in order then to be able to come up with a request and really resolve the conflict. As long as we just stay at the surface or as long as we come from an app as long as we cultivate an attitude that says i want to win i want to put her or him in her or his place you know we, we can't really truly resolve the conflict yeah yeah doris makes a good point in the chat actually conflict's not necessarily a bad thing sometimes you know it enables us to to learn and grow right absolutely yes yeah that's a great great uh, perspective to have yeah yeah um, so I'm uh, going to go to a question from Emily. Uh, so, uh, yep, she uh, said she found the um, session really helpful for building trust, educating stakeholders. Um, but uh, to educate stakeholders about the Scrum Agile process, if that's something they aren't familiar with, do you think that's something helpful to do? Yes, I think so. Uh, I think uh, it will be helpful. But I also think that that shouldn't be the job of the person in charge of the product but that should be the job of uh, the Scrum Master or Agile Coach. Um, so for me, product people should really focus on the product and offer product leadership through uh, you know, vision and uh, product strategy, product roadmap, through building the right connections and managing the relationships and engaging the stakeholders, leading the stakeholders in the right way and through collaborating with the development team. But then you know, in an agile context, I think it's it's really beneficial to have someone like a qualified scrum master or agile coach as a partner on our side who um, takes care of the process and acts as a a coach, as a as a mentor in some cases, as a as a process evangelist, but also who deals with some aspects of organizational development and change. And be it that um, you know, that's not something that's something not quite right in terms of the, the the maturity and effectiveness of the product management function or be it um that don't know that there are not enough scrum masters available for instance um in order to 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 progress the products in an effective way yeah awesome cool uh great thanks for that um question from andrew so uh, andrew is asking um back to the uh the the example um, what if the new feature um, has more value than an existing feature? Uh, should they should they have swapped it out? What's your opinion on sort of swapping maybe work in progress or features that are there? Is that, a, is that, a, is that an allowable tactic or not? That was the story. So uh, swapping features, yeah, of course you can swap features, but I think um, part of what I what I tried to highlight with the um, conflict avoidance strategy is not to uh, kind of stay at the surface and purely look at it as a rational exercise 
Now, again, if, if this is the scenario, then I, you know, you may well disagree with me. That's perfectly okay. But, you know, I would consider Sophie's behavior as not helpful. And in fact, I would consider it as inappropriate. And so if I was the person in charge here, I would take offense. And I, I'd say like, hold on a second. At least I think, I'm, I'm not sure if I'd say it, if I'm daring and courageous enough, but I think like, hold on a second, what the hell is going on here? You know, what, what, what are you doing, Sophie? Um, and so I, you know, as, um, as, I, as I personally would be thinking that, and as I probably would have some strong feelings, I think it wouldn't be enough to say like, okay, let's just swap some features and we're done. You know, I think there's this whole thing around why is Sophie acting as if I was her personal assistant and she just demands that feature and expects it to, to be implemented. She just expects me to say yes. So that's one issue. And then the other issue, why is not she come to the product strategy or product road mapping review session? And why is it her? Where's the sales rep? Whereas one of her team members who should be a, a stakeholder, I mean, he should be, he should be re requesting or she, you know, the sales rep should be requesting the feature, not, not the senior manager, not, not her or his boss. So I think those are the underlying issues that I think need to be addressed in order to truly resolve the conflict. Otherwise you swap the feature and you just kind of strike a deal. But personally, I probably would still hold a bit of a grudge against Sophie. And, you know, if certainly for the next few days, weeks, possibly months, when I bump into her, I think like, oh, Sophie. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, apologies if there are any Sophies on the call. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, it's, you know, it's purely made up. It's just a persona. It's a persona, yeah. Sorry, that's me. Um, so a question from uh, Guarab, I think the name is. Apologies if I've mispronounced the name. Um, so uh, I see a big change in behavior now that we're working with people remotely. Um, mm. What's your thought around it? Are you seeing changes in behavior or maybe different tactics? So it's, a, it's an interesting question and a question that quite honestly is difficult for me to answer because my team's been uh, distributed now for a long time. Um, so in terms of the product management work that I do for the products that I look after, the, the team's been distributed and the, the team that does the design and development work, for instance, is based um, in Brighton, the south coast of the UK. Uh, I'm based in Buckinghamshire, which is like sort of northwest of, of London. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of used to be to be remote and I'm kind of used to do a lot of online work. So it's, it's a difficult one for me for me to comment on. Um, I think that, that it's it seems for some people, you know, from, from, you know, the conversations I've had and, and also the articles that I've read that doing online work actually makes it easier to build trust because you, you get to know aspects of the individuals that find out things about the individuals that, you know, in a pure office environment, normal standard office environment, you wouldn't like, I don't know, like, you know, the, the dog is barking or the child is running in or the postman delivers a parcel or something, or you see bits of the, the living room or the conservatory or wherever people work. And I think that can be quite refreshing, can be nice. It can be a trust building measure, but, but I've, you know, I also know that for some people being online, it can be harder actually to trust people. It can be harder to, to open up and be honest. And that some people really miss that, um, in a way, the intimacy of being in the same room. So, um, you know, but I guess, you know, for many of us, certainly over the last few months, we, we just haven't had our choice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're, I think everybody's uh, still learning the best ways of uh, working through this, isn't it? Question from Natasha from Brighton. What steps would you suggest for someone to take to rebuild a damaged relationship? For instance, if you've used these common unhelpful conflict strategies with a particular person and the relationship has been damaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a, it's a, uh, thank you for asking it. Uh, thank, thank you all for asking questions, by the way. Um, so, um, I, I would suggest considering the, um, conflict resolution model. I, I mentioned earlier, um, nonviolent communication. And I think in my experience, it tends to be easier rather than generally saying, oh, can we have a chat and talk about what's not quite right? Really focus on a specific uh, element of disagreement or conflict uh, and, and ideally the most recent one and kind of try and work through it and, and really share what, what is my perspective and what is the other person's perspective and, and be receptive. Um, as I tried to explain it earlier, where you know, we try not to quickly evaluate and judge and be judgmental or overly critical, but kind of let the person really 
uh, allow the person to have her or his perspective and be accepting in that sense without necessarily approving. Um, and then try and uh, understand, you know, what's going on behind the scenes and share what emotions were present or maybe still are present. You know, how, how did, how, you know, what did you see and hear? How did it make you feel? And maybe what you maybe, maybe again, some of those feelings are still present. What are they like? You know, did you feel anger, frustration, worry, anxiety, envy, fear, whatever it might have been? And what did the other person feel? And then, you know, why did the person feel what she or he felt? What's going on there? you know, what are the underlying needs or interests? Um, what are the under, underlying personal goals? And then once we know that, once I understand, okay, what's really going on here for me. And so for me, for instance, in this scenario here, that's still, that I'm still sharing with you, you know, it'd probably be a lot about being recognized as the product person. And there'd be probably a lot of respect for me as, as the underlying need. And I wouldn't probably wouldn't feel uh, treated respectfully. So that's probably what I'd have to sort of get clear in my head and then, you know, communicate it to Sophie and, and, and ask her to be more respectful and treat me in what I would consider then a more respectful way, but also then be specific and tell her, you know, um, what kind of behavior I'd be looking for. And then, you know, for Sophie, she'd do the same thing. And then hopefully we can accept each other's requests and that would then resolve the conflict. Yeah. Nice. Thank you for that. Um, almost a follow on from that from uh, Mohammed. Um, what if there's no open channel of communication at all because they've they've blocked you out? How do you even sort of get started in that scenario? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, an, another great question. Um, so the both the non the the nonviolent communication model and the behavioural change survey model they both assume that the other person or the other party. Um, is willing to open up and collaborate at least at some stage so what we can do is we can initiate the process and we can um, invite the person to to sort of engage in a conversation we, 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 you know we can we can make an effort to actively listen to listen deeply and we can make an effort to to empathize and try and understand and try and reach out with with warm heartedness again doesn't mean that we approve it doesn't mean that we agree but it means we take a genuine interest and then hopefully you know that'll give rise to building trust and that hopefully then will allow us to exercise a positive influence and, and continue with the, the the conflict resolution process but there's of course no guarantee if somebody does not want to um be involved in that process or play a constructive part in that process then there's little that 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 i think i could do as an individual uh, then often it's a matter of escalating the issue and you know getting help from uh, line management and human resources possibly involving an outside mediator who would then try and uh, you know find uh, mediate the process the, the resolution process and find a sustainable uh, solution Excellent. Good. Thank you for that. Um, so the next question is from uh, another Mohammed, different one this time. Um, what is your perspective about the product manager avoiding considering technical challenges, for example, technical debt, uh, and it's a development team expertise. So could you please share some insights about this? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for asking. So how much tech, how how much technical knowledge uh, a product manager need and you know how deep technical skills have to be it very much depends in my experience on the product so if you are in an end user facing product like a mobile app or web app people interact with end users interact with people like you and me interact with then usually you don't need a great amount of uh, technical and in-depth knowledge and understanding you know i think an interest and awareness Will all you know will be helpful and you know i think that's something that as product people we should have but if we are in a technical product um, something that's integrated into a larger offering like say a, a back-end platform then we do need in-depth uh, technical know-how that's just sort of generally sort of help us determine how much how much do we need to know um, things like uh, technical debt. Technical debt is an interesting one um, because technical debt really impacts our ability as product people to progress the product and adapt it significantly. So the higher the level of technical debt, the harder it will be for us to change and adjust our product. Now that's particularly difficult as long as our product is young or still, still growing significantly and experiencing quite a bit of change. 
it, it also makes it difficult to then go through a life cycle extension by taking it to a new market or adding a, a brand new feature, for instance. So generally, the younger a product is, the more difficult it is to experience a high level of technical debt. And the more I'd recommend to say, you know, avoid technical debt and plan in time to address key areas of technical debt. Um, the original uh, suggestion around technical debt comes from Bill Wake, and I, I can't quite remember when he suggested that, but I think that was a long time ago. Um, and Bill Wake originally used that term to suggest that it might be worthwhile to essentially push out very quickly an MVP, a very initial version of your product, with low quality and inferior technologies just to see what the market response is, the general market response is, and then to rewrite it using the right technologies and writing good quality code. So that's that's where it comes from originally. And that will be called intentional technical debt. So again, you know, I think as product people, quality and the, the quality of our digital products should be uh, an important indicator. It's something that we should keep an eye on. And, um, and yeah, if, if the, the quality goes down, engage in a conversation with the development team and see, you know, what are the right, uh, what are the right actions that we should take. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, Doris made, made a good point in the chat window. Uh, sometimes I wonder why there's not more psychologists in this, uh, in this field of work. So uh, I think that's been a, a big um, takeaway and a big theme for tonight, you know, the psychological aspect of uh, what we need to deal with as product people. Um, unfortunately, it's 7.29. There's still loads of questions coming in, but uh, I think we're, we're, we're out of time. Uh, so uh, we do have to draw things to a close.